was busy and um, didn't really choose to take the blocks of time it takes to write a novel. But then the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and we were told that we had to basically isolate ourselves. And on about the second day of that, I said to Brad, well, I'm gonna write a book. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point in time, for me, it was a sanity project. It was mm -hmm. just a place to take myself, you know, my own imaginary world where I could have some control over what happened. <laughs> and that's how this book came to be. So what I'm going to, um, read for you are just three, some of you who were, have heard some of this before, and I just can't do anything about that. <laughs> but I'm gonna try to introduce you to some of the main characters, and, um, and I'll tell you more as we go along. So the, um, this book, Toby's Last Resort, happens 10 years after The Floor of the Sky. So now Toby is 82. And um, I'm going to read just short excerpts from the first chapter because it has more um, summary than, uh, than you'll want to know, just to kind of introduce you to her and to what, what the framework of the book is. The last time we saw Toby, she was sitting on George's front porch, facing east toward the promise of daybreak while the sun squatted in the western sky. Hear that? the lilting strain of a metal lark, a solo piccolo. Toby follows the worn path from the front porch of George's house over the rise to the family cemetery, late afternoon in early summer. Prairie grass rolls across the hills, verdant from spring rains, dotted here and there by a lonesome tree. A breeze tickles the sage, rattles the leaves in the cottonwoods. The air smells as brisk and green as freshly scythed hay. Toby stops at the top of the rise, lets her gaze follow the sweep of land, turns to take in all four directions. She owns this property as far as the horizon, homesteaded by her grandfather not long after the Civil War. She's the last bold and likely to live here, and she's grown old. What will happen to this land when she's gone? For now, Toby finds Sola standing on the ground she's known all her life, covered by a canopy of sky tucked to the four corners of the earth. She slips the looped wire off a post to open the gate to the family plot. Grandma grass and a few yuccas entwine with the barbed wire fence. Six old boots atop fence posts toes pointing home. Toby stops briefly to pay homage to her mother, Rosemary. Her father, Luther, is buried here too. She's too old now to spit on his grave, though he was a mean-spirited man who one way or another wounded all three of his children. Sorrow comes in waves, she thinks, as she moves past these graves to the stone she's come to tend. George lies here. She remembers precisely when the idea for Toby's last resort came to her. She'd stood looking out the window of George's house on a brilliant January day, the sun luminous in a cloudless sky, the hills dusted white like a powdered sugar donut. She held a mug of coffee, hankering for a splash of whiskey she was trying to avoid. She looked around the living room, the threadbare couch, the worn braided rug on the bare board floor. Ran her fingers over the back of the rocking chair, picked up an afghan and held it to her nose to capture his scent. What now, George? You were my last resort, she whispered. She swears that she heard George laughing. Not something I'd want on my tombstone, he seemed to say. You're not ready to quit on life, are you? She'd gone straight to the phone and called Tom Edwards, a local contractor, and asked for an appointment. Then she went to see Malcolm Lord, the banker. They tried to talk her out of it, but by the end of the next summer, there were three one-room cabins built on her land. 
Dr. Penny Sadler helped her advertise in medical magazines, on the radio, local newspapers. She put a big ad in the Nebraska Life magazine, complete with pictures. Toby's last resort. A place for the wounded, brokenhearted, misfits, and dreamers. Mm -hmm. Time and space to think, to heal, to breathe. She promised no program, no therapy, no structure of any kind, just a safe haven. Each applicant had to state their reasons for coming to Toby's last resort, and because no daughter of Luther Bolden could assume that all people are innocuous, they had to submit to a background check. Toby charged a reasonable rate and offered her fully furnished cabins for time periods of one to three months. The first summer, she had only two guests, each for one month, a university professor writing a book about grasshoppers and a bronc rider with a broken leg who needed a place to recuperate. <laughs> After that, word spread, and people began to come from surrounding states as well as Nebraska. A man awaiting a divorce, a wildlife artist, professors on sabbatical, a couple who'd lost a son to drugs, a young woman fleeing an abusive husband. All in all, it's a good scheme, but Toby turned 82 in February. Her wiry hair is white as a bald eagle's head. At her last checkup, Dr. Penny said everything looked fine, but Toby knows she is slowing down, mentally and physically. Mornings, she hobbles to the kitchen for that first cup of coffee. She falls asleep in a chair with an open book on her lap. She misplaces things. Her mind wanders down long passageways of time as it has now squatting by George's grave, forgetting what it was she walked out here to tell him. A morning dove pitches its hollow hoo-hoo into the still air as she grips the top of the stone, uses it to help her stand. Well, old man, she says, her hand lingering on the stone, have a restful night. She laughs at her little joke and walks back over the same path. Once over the rise, she sees an unfamiliar car parked next to George's white picket fence. She porches her hand over her eyes but can't make out the license plate. As she nears, a figure rises from the rocker and moves toward her. A woman, tall, bottle blonde, a slight floozy air about her. She's out here on a ranch wearing city shoes and a too short something that might be called a skirt. The woman stops and waits for Toby, arms crossed, one hip cocked. What the hell are you doing here, Toby says. <laughs> That's Toby. And you probably guess that the floozy is Nola Jean. <laughs> and they, uh, as you might also guess, have a rather um, tenuous relationship, and that's a lot of what the book is about, among other things. But I'm gonna read a little short scene. Well, I have to give you this background first and then tell you why I chose to write it. When I was at this Sand Hills Ranch, there were a lot of cottonwood trees, and I was, uh, I guess the word is bragging <laughs> to my fellow writers that I could play Amazing Grace on a cottonwood leaf. <laughs> and so they said, prove it. And so I did. <laughs> and then they all wanted to know how to do that, so I was trying to give them an impromptu session how to blow the, a cottonwood leaf like a whistle, and we had a great lot of fun doing it. And so I captured that scene in this book and I used it um, as a way of delineating the relationship between Toby and Nola G. Um, and I should tell you, I'm not gonna read, I, what is, I'm not gonna read the, well, I'll, every, every Friday night at five o'clock, Toby hosts what she calls five o'clocks. And everybody who is at the resort or anybody working there comes and they have coffee or iced tea or and usually something like pie. <laughs> so the five o'clocks are a tradition. And this is later in the book at the five o'clock and there are characters in here who have not 
meant, but just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Isabel, who is one of the people who has come to the resort, and some of you who know my background, Isabel is recovering from a cancer diagnosis. But she and Nola Jean have become friends during the course of this week. So it's Isabel who calls the group to attention. Hey, everybody, I found out that Nola Jean has a hidden talent. Nola Jean groans. The others chime in, urging Isabel to tell. Nola Jean confessed to me this afternoon that she can play Amazing Grace on a cottonwood leaf. <laughs> no way, Corey says. Laughing, the group moves to the side of George's lawn where the cottonwood branches spread across the fence. Anita comes to stand beside Toby. Anita works with Toby. And the two of them watch, like spectators at a rodeo afraid the cowboy will get bucked off. Nola Jean plucks a leaf from the tree, folds it in half, pinches it at the top and bottom, blows into the opening, and uses her fingers on the leaf to change the pitch. Matthew speaks first. That might be amazing, Grace, <laughs> if you've got a good imagination. <laughs> Nola Jean laughs too. I never said I was a virtuoso. How'd you learn to do that, Gabe says. Walter, my father showed me. Toby's surprised to hear that. She never knew Walter to blow on a cottonwood leaf. After all these years to think she could learn something new about him. Show me, Isabel says. With that, they all pluck a few leaves. Nola Jean demonstrates how to fold the leaf, careful not to crease it, and where to place their fingers. At first, no one can get anything resembling a pitch out of the leaves. But eventually, first one and then another gets the hang of it. Along the way, all of them fall into laughing, punch, drunk, and giddy. Let's do the Blue Danube, Matthew says. Then he proceeds to sing, da, 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 and the others all chime in with two high toots followed by two low toots. <laughs> they try, we will, we will rock you, and when the saints go marching in. They keep it up a long time, howling and hooting, releasing the tension that all adults, and maybe this group in particular, carry, stomping their feet to the rhythms when the tunes are unrecognizable. Anita shakes her head. They've gone mad, she says, but she can't help smiling. Toby watches in amazement. The sheer joy of it astounds her. She watches them clothed in summer colors, bending in half with glee, stomping and dancing like a living floral ballet right there on her front lawn, and she is swept with sorrow. She cannot fathom how she has not known that Nola Jean is capable of spreading this kind of light. Okay, and then one more, because it's fun to read. <laughs> um, there's another character in the book called Josie, and Josie and her husband, Dan, have been married for 45 years, and she has just revealed to him a big secret, and you'll have to either read the book or buy it to find out what that is, and he's been very upset by this, and he's gone off, and when he comes back, he tells her, he says, it wasn't the thing itself, but she didn't trust him enough to tell him, and he wonders what other secrets she's held. And she says, oh, no, there aren't any. And he goes off again. So this is the next day. Late afternoon, Dan comes home. Josie has no idea where he's been, and she doesn't ask. He says nothing, picks up a book, a thick tome dedicated to U.S. history, and heads out onto the deck. She moves around the kitchen a while, watching him, trying to decide what to do. Eventually, she pours two glasses of red wine, opens the sliding glass doors, sets his glass down on a small table, sits opposite him. He hardly looks up from his book to acknowledge her presence. They are strangers to each other in this moment. Josie clears her throat. She's been thinking all day, rehearsing this speech. There were other things, she says. 
Dan closes the book, looks at her, his face stricken, the condemned waiting for the executioner. She winces, her lip trembles. Once, I bought an expensive jacket. I paid for it with cash and lied to you about what it cost. <laughs> he waits a while to respond, and he nods. Which jacket? <laughs> I wore it to your office party, gold and black silk. He looks away, then back. I like the way you looked in that jacket, he says. <laughs> you did? Yeah. She fishes a tissue out of her pocket, blows her nose. He sips his wine, she sips hers, neither speaks for a while. Remember that Emma Marie, he says? The one who always wore high heels? Her breath comes ragged. Once at a conference, she invited me up to her room for a drink. Oh, this is it then. Josie feels the floor drop away from under her. This is the retribution part. This is what she has coming. I didn't go. You didn't? No, I didn't, he says. Why would I? At that, she feels a flutter of hope, mm -hmm. a sigh. I felt guilty anyway, he says, because something made Emma Marie think I might. You were attracted to her, she says. He shrugs. I was flattered, I guess. You never mentioned it, she says. No, I didn't. More silence. She knows him. He's looking out on the space behind her, over her shoulder. She sees his mental wheels churning. What she doesn't know is where the spinning wheel of fortune will land. When he finally looks at her, his eyes are clear. Anything else, he says? She inhales sharply. Nothing will suffice now but bald truth. Lots, she says. Things the boys did I never told you about. Once I dinged our car and let you think it was another driver in a parking lot. <laughs> at that, he chuckles. Not a full out laugh, but it's something. He rubs his hand along his jaw. Me too, he says. Really? He shrugs. You know that gold heart necklace you like so much? She reaches to her throat, the one she's wearing now. I sent my secretary out to buy something for you. I had forgotten our anniversary. She picked it out. She nods. Well, she doesn't like the necklace as much as he thinks she does. She only wears it to please him. We could go on like this all day, she says. Maybe we should, or not, she whispers. After a moment, after weighing the options the way he does, he says, you're right. <laughs> thinking about when I wrote The Floor of the Sky, well, let me say, you know how we all watch now a million things on television because that's how we filled our time and we watch these series and maybe there are eight, ten episodes and still after you watch eight, ten episodes they end with a cliffhanger because you know they're preparing for a second season and then sometimes they don't have a second season <laughs> and you never find out what happened. Well, that is not what, what's going on. I mean, when I wrote The Floor of the Sky, I wrote it, I thought I was done. And then the characters kind of just stuck with me and they ended up being in, a, in another book. So I learned to never say never. <laughs> um, because Toby's getting older, but then, you know, so am I. <laughs> so one of the concerns in this book is what to do about aging. 
And that sure is a topic of conversation among me and my contemporaries these days. And uh, and that was a sure part of. So maybe if there's another book, I'll have figured out <laughs> what to do. But I, I don't have any thoughts of one. But thank you. <laughs> She's a fun character. Mm -hmm. You know, in oh sorry, oh, go ahead. In, in your writing, um, you. You just seem to know your characters so well and have so much love for them, and I'm curious if they talk to you. Well, not audibly, <laughs> usually, <laughs> but I do, I think that writing is a whole lot about listening. For, and, and I do think of writing as listening to my characters and what they have to teach me. And um, they do, they do get to feel like real people <laughs> that I know, and I mean, I, I know I conjured them up, <laughs> but but they, um, and I do always love all my characters, even Luther, I don't think I loved Luther, but he was a very minor <laughs> character. <laughs> but um, even the ones that are difficult, or maybe especially the difficult ones, um, because it's a, it takes a long time to write a novel, and who wants to spend time with someone that you really can't stand <laughs> all that time? So, um, so I don't know that. The, I'm, when I start, I always I did this as a playwright. I write character descriptions and character histories and things that may never appear in the book, but just as a way of getting to know my character. So in that sense, I guess they do talk to me. <laughs> yeah. You, Nancy. Yeah, I was just going to say, so with your characters, though, what's pretty neat is that you're taking some of your own experiences and making that part of the character. So in, in, they are kind of like you, then, in some well, aspects. Well, <laughs> some people, you know, have said every character is a writer yeah. in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it isn't. And, um, and in this book especially, I didn't have anybody particular in mind for the characters, but my own experience. Yeah. If, if you, Brad, Brad, I can hear Brad when he's reading along, he starts chuckling. I know he's thinking, oh yeah, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, you have to write out of what you know. Yeah. It's kind of funny because Bob and Beth, they're our neighbors. And Bob was like, have you read this yet? And I said, no, but I'm going to. And he said, hurry up, because I'm waiting for Deb to, to read it, because I have questions and I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's like, okay, so he can't wait to start talking and asking questions. And it was cute. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah. I have kind of a weird question. So if you don't have an answer, it's absolutely fine. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think we have places in our lives that we know really well and they sort of inform who we are and for you it sounds like the sand hill trains are, or not trains, but the, yeah. what do you call them? Sand, sand hills. hills. The sand hills are that place. So, and then you went out there and did the retreat where this little kernel of the book came and my question is, did the land give you any surprises that you didn't expect? showed up in this book? Um, well, so I'm, I did, <coughs> I did do, uh, when I was at that Sand Hills retreat, there was a kind of a ring of cottonwood trees that I wrote an essay about at some point comparing them to um, Gaudi's cathedral in Barcelona, mm -hmm. you know, that he based yeah. on trees. And I, I found I could, they were so old, you know, cottonwood trees, the bark is very ridged. I could place my whole hand in the ridge of those trees. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I don't know if those are surprises, but those are, I think of them as mysteries revealed, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I do love that landscape. And it's funny, how I just think we're kind of imprinted with the landscapes of our childhood. Beth Waterhouse, who's sitting back there, once said to me, because Beth grew up with forest. You feel, you feel safe in the forest. Right, yeah. And Beth said, 
I don't know, Pam, when I'm on the prairie, I just feel so untethered, like I could just fly off. And I say, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and you know, we, I think the forest is beautiful, too, and I can really enjoy it, but I begin to get claustrophobic. Even when we drive through the mountains, when we come, you know how you sometimes come down and there's an open meadow? It's like, <gasps> <laughs> So it's something about, um, for me, about possibility and openness. And I, I compared it once to how I used to feel when we'd walk out of my grandmother's house when she wasn't very well, and we had to be quiet. You know, and we could go outside and then we could run and play. <laughs> That's how I feel when I walk in, out where the prairie is open. We had an opportunity, Brad and I just drove home from Denver. Our daughter and her kids live in Denver. And we drove, um, usually when we drive across the sand hills, we drive a, a northern route in Nebraska, but this was straight down the middle of a road we'd never been on before. And there is just something that sings to me from that landscape. Mm -hmm. It's as like Leslie for you, it's the ocean mm -hmm. and the east. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I haven't lived there for a long time and maybe that's part of it. It's the homesickness and the nostalgia mm -hmm. for childhood. And if I lived there I might be sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> I will own that I only read the second one. I haven't read the, the first book yet. No, I will. But the, of the characters, I'm just interested if there's more to shed on. Anita really spoke to me. That, yeah. That controlled, but kind, but but. Yeah. And the, the, um, I somewhere read a description of your characters or something the way that you use or describe flinty women. And I just, I love that word yeah. in connection with it. And I feel like there's gotta be somebody in there who is, who drives that character. She uh, really, what sticks the most for me with her is that uh, she loves the floor she can scrub. Yeah. I just, you know that person. You, you know that, that energy and that dynamic. Yeah. And I just, anything else about Anita that well, for Kevin's, Anita is um, a Mexican woman who Toby hires Anita and Louise to help her on Toby's last resort. And she has quite a history. And um, she's loving but tough. Yeah. And um, I don't know, Kevin, you grew up in Nebraska. I mean, my mother, Brad's mother, Brad's six aunts, <laughs> you know, we knew a lot of women. Plenty. <laughs> yeah, who, where um, it takes some kind of strength and courage mm -hmm. maybe to to live in that kind of landscape, especially our, we're, we come from families of farmers mm -hmm. and um, to try to make a living on that land requires something plenty. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose for me, my mother, um, who had a lot of hardship in her young life, but was amazingly resilient. So I didn't have a particular person in mind, if that's what you're asking yeah. me. Although there are, um, that part of Nebraska, we had, we didn't have any um, kids in school who were black, or, but we did have a lot of Mexican friends because they came as migrant workers mm -hmm. and then ended up staying forming lives and um, so that's what I knew. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I like her too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she and Toby have an interesting relationship there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'm wondering if uh, I don't want to interrupt it but I'm wondering if uh, before you all go if you're willing to have your Should it, I might show, it might wind up on the, on the, web, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'll give you a chance to, to leave if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So if I hand over there, do you, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just go over here and sit right in front of the camera. <laughs> While I'm doing this, you can think of more questions. <laughs> I wish we could have brought a cottonwood piece. I know, I don't think there are any. I'm Okay, I might take a couple of those. Here we go. Thank you. Well, okay, any last questions? Otherwise, yeah. Do you think Nebraska is for everyone? No. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. You are a great audience. <laughs>